1. I really like Les Arafim's music but I don't think their concept suits the members at all, I agree, it's actually funny how they sing about making it look easy, yet their vocals sound like a cry for help, if I'm being honest about Les Arafim's concept, they're about as convincing as a square peg in a round hole, first off, imputing this tough and fearless persona is just downright cringeworthy. A badass concept requires attitude, confidence, and a certain level of fierceness, but when you watch Les Arafim perform, it's like they're playing dress-up in their mom's closet, some members look like lost puppies on stage, lacking that natural swagger that a badass concept demands, it's like they're trying to be something they're not, and girl, it's painfully obvious, and here's where they really fall flat, their vocals, a badass concept demands strong, commanding voices that can deliver powerful performances, but when you listen to Les Arafim, it's like they're whispering sweet lullabies instead of unleashing their inner badasses, their attempts at sounding tough come off as forced and unnatural, like they're trying way too hard to be something they're not, sure, they might have two talented members here and there, but when it comes to fitting their concept, it's clear that some of them are just plain misses, whether it's their mismatched image or underwhelming vocals, they're simply not cutting it as the fearless group they claim to be. 2. Lesser Atham's minimalism in mediocre music has been for a little while the reasons why they are pretty successful, but continuing on releasing boring title tracks and generic music as a whole and calling it minimalistic is gonna hurt them in a long run, I agree, Lesser Atham's tracks are hitting that snooze button hard, huh? It's like they're on a treadmill, lots of movement but not really going anywhere, and that autotune? It's like they're trying to hide the fact that not everyone in the group can hit those notes without a little digital nudge, sure, Yunjin and Chaiwan might be carrying the vocal weight, but when the rest hit the mic, it's like a feline symphony in the worst way, and I get it, Perfect Nights probably had them thinking they struck gold with that western pop vibe, but here's the tea, if I'm craving a burger, I'm not going to a vegan joint for an imitation, if I want western pop, I'll go straight to the source, not to an echo, Lucerafim's got that minimalist aesthetic down, but it's a tightrope walk, right? Lean too much one way, and you're an innovator, too much the other, and you're just plain boring, they've got to spice it up, mix in some variety, or they'll just blend into the background noise. Music's all about that fresh beat, that new sound. Stagnate, and your yesterday's news, so, here's hoping they find that balance before they become just another could-have-been footnote in K-pop history. 3. I hate how everyone is ignoring Kiss of Life's talent when it comes to fifth-gen leaders. The only disadvantage they have is not coming from a big company, I agree. Kiss of Life have got talent in spades, Belle belting out those high notes like she's channeling Ariana Grande, Natty with her undeniable charm, Julie's rap skills, and Hinole's unique appeal and potential? They're like a dream team waiting to hit the big time, but let's not put the cart before the horse, sure, they've been making waves online, but let's be real, it's mostly the casual listeners tuning in, they've got the vocals, the rap skills, the stage presence, and the sass to rival any seasoned group, but it's going to take a lot more than that to compete with the bigwigs of the industry, they're not signed to a major label, now, if they were under one of the big four, we'd be having a different conversation, they'd have the backing and the resources to really make a splash, but as it stands, they're like a small fish in a big pond, and it's going to take some serious maneuvering to get them to the top, so, while it's lovely to imagine Kiss of Life reaching dizzying heights of success, let's not get ahead of ourselves, it's an uphill battle for these girls, and while I'm rooting for them, I'm also not holding my breath, they've got the talent, no doubt about that, but talent alone isn't going to cut it in the cutthroat world of K-pop. 4. The new versions of Babby Monsters batter up and stuck in the middle sound way worse than the originals without a high-in, her voice sounds very loud and out of place, kind of like how people think about and mixes Lily's voice, but I don't see that problem with her the same way I see it with a high-in's voice, I totally get where you're coming from, but to me, even though I absolutely hated Baby Monsters' debut album, a high-in's vocals were definitely the standout, both a high-in and N mixes Lily are. My favorite fourth and fifth gen vocalists, They've got that western pop diva vibe that's a breath of fresh air in the K-pop scene, they're not just hitting notes, they're delivering them with a punch that screams I'm here, and you're gonna listen, it's that Pink and Kelly Clarkson kind of raw power that makes you sit up and take notice, but here's the rub, not everyone's on board with that style, it's a departure from the polished, high-pitched vocals we're used to in K-pop, some folks like you think it's too much, like they're trying to outsing the track itself, take Belle from Kiss of Life, she's in the same boat. People say she's overshadowing her group, but maybe that's just her voice refusing to be tamed, so it's just a matter of preference. 5. BTS solo era has divided armies significantly. Most of them only bother to stream the Magne line while they leave the Hyung line in the dust, I see your point, but let me elaborate on this more, the Magne line is getting the star treatment, and the Hyung line is like the backup dancers wondering when their streaming records are coming, the media and the fans are all about those streaming numbers and social media likes. 
And let's just say the older guys aren't exactly breaking the internet, enter Jungkook with 7, and bam, it's a lockdown, but not the kind you're thinking. It's a streaming party, and the invitation seems to have accidentally left out the rest of the band, talk about playing favorites, it's like one kid getting all the candy while the others get the wrappers, the army's got passion, but it's also got more sides than a Rubik's Cube, and not all of them match up, you've got the pop lovers who skip the rap tracks like bad commercials, and the old timers who want the old BTS like it's a classic car, but the newbie armies? They came for the pop, stayed for the pop, and wouldn't know a rap line if it hit them with a beat drop. I mean, even Suga is out here taking singing lessons, probably cause he knows the score, the fans want those pop hooks, not the rap verses they need a dictionary for, the numbers don't lie, and they're singing a tune that's more vocal than hip-hop. 6. I hate SM more because Lucas debuted as a soloist and Sunghan is still on hiatus. They chose Lucas who is no talent over Sunghan who is talented, oh my god thank you. SM really know how to mess things up when it comes to their artists. Let's dive into the Lucas situation, shall we? I refuse to believe he's some kind of victim, sure, he still has fans, but SM went above and beyond to polish his image, and it leaves a bitter taste in my mouth, and don't even get me started on those die-hard fans defending him like he's a flawless angel. But here's what really gets under my skin, while Lucas is getting showered with special treatment and attention, poor Ten is left in the shadows with nothing. Have you seen the stark difference in their budgets? Lucas gets not one, but two extravagant music videos, while Ten's debut MV looks like it was filmed in someone's basement on a shoestring budget, it's like SM is playing a cruel prank on all of us, and let's not forget about Sunghan, who's practically treated like yesterday's trash while Lucas enjoys his redemption arc, plus, it drives me insane to see how SM made Way V endure a painfully long hiatus because of Lucas, only to receive almost nothing in return, but when it comes to Lucas, they roll out the red carpet, I swear, I'll never understand SM and their messed up priorities, it's like they're banking on the fact that most K-pop stands are shallow and only care about looks and superficial qualities, it's enough to make your blood boil and brace yourself, because here's another outrageous move by SM. They had the audacity to release Rise's song Siren and completely edit Sunghan out of it. Can you believe that? The poor guy did absolutely nothing wrong, yet they erased him from his own group. Meanwhile, Lucas keeps getting chance after chance. It's as if Lucas is somehow more valuable to them than Sunghan, even though he hasn't done anything to deserve such preferential treatment. It's almost like celebrities aren't allowed to have normal lives because it shatters the illusion of their perfect idol image. Seriously, what's the deal? It's like they can get away with anything just because they have loads of money, well, you know what? I can't wait for the day when SM faces their own reckoning, they deserve a major downfall, and I hope it happens sooner rather than later, this whole situation is simply unacceptable, they let Lucas make a grand comeback despite all the nonsense he's pulled, while poor Sunghan is practically erased from existence just because he faced some hate for being a regular young adult. SM better start counting their days because I'm absolutely fed up with their shady antics. 7. Twice is doing fine and if they are not doing well on the charts and album sales doesn't mean that they're flopping, they are already successful enough to deal with anything and JYP needs to step up twice promotion tactics, I agree. Twice career trajectory is indeed not your typical rise and fall narrative, it's more like a strategic game of chess, where early success is the queen that draws everyone's attention, but the pawns, the loyal fandom, are the ones slowly moving forward, ensuring lasting control of the board, I know twice recent comebacks suck. But their ability to maintain a strong fan base despite the chart's cold shoulder is like having a solid gold credit card. They don't need the approval of the masses. When they've got a dedicated fandom willing to invest, the chatter about twice waning popularity is just that chatter. It's like saying a seasoned actor has lost their touch because they're not in the latest blockbuster. Twice has moved past the point of needing to prove themselves with every release. They've built an empire. And empires aren't easily toppled by the flavor of the month. Take Mamaland, for instance. They were the flavor of the month, had everyone doing the boom boom, but, where are they now? Exactly, a flash in the pan without a solid fanbase to back them up, that's where Twice stands out, they've built an army of fans ready to stream, buy, and cheer no matter what, that's the kind of loyalty money can't buy. 8. Girl groups will always have the spotlight over boy groups because boy group music appeals to a specific fanbase, while girl group music is more catered towards the general public and is more easy to listen to, I agree, Girl groups attract more casual listeners and general public attention, while boy group have more solid fandoms, and let me explain why, girl groups are the main act, dazzling the crowd with tunes that stick like gum on a hot sidewalk, they're the ones headlining the ads, smiling from billboards, and shaking hands with fashion moguls, it's like they've got a fast pass to fame, 
becoming that girls before they'd even had a chance to prove they're more than just a pretty face, boy bands, though, they're the sideshow, the ones who get up close and personal with their fans, they're not just faces on a screen, they're the guys sharing laughs and behind-the-scenes antics, they might not be the talk of the town, but their fans would walk through fire for them. But let's cut through the glitter for a sec, this whole scene is a well-oiled machine, churning out fantasies faster than fans can click follow, girl groups are sold as the ultimate dream, the life everyone wants but can't have, unless you buy what they're selling, of course. And boy bands? They're the boy next door, the just like us illusion, it's all a game of smoke and mirrors, where the only real winners are the ones raking in the cash from both sides of the fantasy. 9. YG groups, specifically Blackpink and Baby Monster, have the best B-sides, while the only Blackpink B-sides I like are Hope Not and You Never Know, the rest isn't much to write home about, the same old recycled Teddy formula over and over again, and for Baby Monster, other than their song Dream, which was okay, the rest is the same Blackpink textbook all over again, but if you enjoyed it, good for you.